All right, so let's jump right into our review. We're gonna look first at concepts from before the midterm. Now, as you know, this test is mostly non-cumulative. There will be some true false questions, as well as a handful of the short answer questions that are about pre-midterm material. But most of the time when we see material from before the midterm, it's in the context of the things we learned after the midterm. So obviously we've studied politics throughout the entire semester, right? So even though we defined it before the midterm, this definition is still highly relevant to material we've covered since. So we know that politics is basically about collective action, right? Um, and it's how to get people to work together, even if they maybe disagree a little bit on the goals of the action. As Harold Laswell put it, politics is just about who gets what, why, and when. Now, if politics is all about collective action, then government is really about solving these collective action problems. So we've seen a lot of different collective action problems this semester, things like coordination problems, prisoners' dilemmas, the tragedy of the commons, and the problem of free riders and how to eliminate them, right? So we see, for example, coordination problems in the context of interest groups, which we looked at in our third unit, the unit right after the midterm, right? How do we get interest group members to coordinate their action? And we know that smaller interest groups with more at stake are going to be better at coordinating than larger interest groups with maybe just sort of broader, vaguer things at stake. So we've seen a lot about prisoners' dilemmas. For example, the relationship between politicians and the media could be seen as a prisoner's dilemma, right? They both need each other, yet neither side can trust each other, right? We also see this um, when we look at a lot of the policymaking issues we talked about in our fourth unit. For example, uh, in social security reform, right, entitlement reform. It has to get done, but neither side really wants to be blamed for the hardships that will come from any sort of entitlement reform, right? Someone's always gonna be unhappy with what has to be done to reform social security and other entitlements. So neither side wants the blame. And because they can't trust the other side not to blame them, right? So not to just like point fingers at each other, they are in a prisoner's dilemma. They can't get anything done. Not cooperating with each other is the short-term best solution in their minds, right? They're rational and not working together is safer than risking getting blamed if you do work together. However, if you both work together, you will avert the crisis of social security and Medicare being insolvent. So what we will probably see is once we're much closer to those deadlines, those will act as sort of outside enforcement, right? And force the two parties to work together because at that point, the short-term short costs of not working together will be too high. Now, tragedy of the commons, we've seen in many different um, circumstances again, right? These are basically just, uh, instead of a prisoner's dilemma where the sides, uh, basically can't communicate with each other, right? They're, in case of um, entitlement reform, Republicans and Democrats, they're not gonna like talk strategy together, right? So I suppose they could theoretically communicate, but they can't really communicate, right? In practice, they would not be talking to each other about strategy. That's why they can't trust each other. The tragedy of the commons, typically there is communication between all the different sides, but we still can't trust each other, right? And that's how, overuse, we all end up freely overusing the commons, leading to its ruination, right? That's a real problem because short term, it makes sense to freely use the commons, right? There's no real downside. It doesn't cost you anything. That's the whole point of free, right? But long term, it's going to cost everyone a lot, right? So we talked about this in terms of global climate change, specifically carbon emissions. So globally, carbon emissions are a tragedy of the commons. It's costless to emit carbon emissions. But if everyone does that and everyone thinks, oh, it's just costless, I can you know, drive my gas guzzler, it's fine. But if every single person in the world does this, every country sets laws that allow for this, we will see a tragedy of the commons.
right? The commons, the global climate will be ruined, right? So we have to come and work together to avoid that. That's often where the UN will step in, right? Come up with these different climate agreements where they help all the different sides negotiate so that we can trust the other sides. Because what we don't want in this situation is a free rider, right? We don't want one country saying, well, I don't have to enforce these rules because if everyone else does, the global climate's gonna be fine and my costless consumption isn't gonna be a problem, right? We saw the same thing uh, with shirking during the Civil War, uh, sorry, Revolutionary War. So we want to eliminate those free riding countries because if one country free rides, another country is gonna be like, well, why do they get to free ride on our sacrifice, on our cutting carbon emissions? So maybe they won't cut their carbon emissions and they'll try to free ride. If every country starts doing this, we just end up back in our tragedy of the commons, right? So we have to figure out ways to eliminate free riders. We also saw this with healthcare, right? With um, building a government health insurance program that health insurers wanted to eliminate the young invincibles, free riders on sort of the uh, public health system that would allow for them to go in cases of real emergencies to an emergency room and get treated, but not by insurance because, well, they're healthy and probably there isn't going to be an emergency, right? So we needed to eliminate those in order to avoid a death spiral and the insurance industry sort of collapsing in on itself. So we see that all four of these collective action problems came up after the midterm. So they are all fair game in any section of the test. Now, how does the government solve these problems? If politics is about co collective action and government is there to solve collective action problems, what tools does the government use? Well, they have all sorts of different tools, right? They can set rules and regulations. So they can make laws about things, for example. Um, they have jurisdiction. Who can do what? That encourages specialization. Remember, we saw that with committees in Congress. In Congress, committees have different jurisdictions, which allows for specialization and for the people in those committees to become experts on a specific policy area, reducing information costs for everyone. It may also enable deal-making in Congress, right? Log rolling works better because the different committees have different jurisdictions. Now, this relates to, I'm gonna skip decisiveness for just a moment, agenda power, right? Because they have different jurisdictions, they also have agenda power over different types of bills, right? The Agriculture Committee is going to be able to release agriculture bills to the floor rather than killing them in the committee. So that also enables deal-making in committees in Congress. Now, apologies, let's go back to decisiveness. So decisiveness, sometimes people just need to be able to say, this is how things are, right? We have all sorts of examples of that. Um, in, for example, the president, right? In foreign affairs, the president has an awful lot of power in this way, right? The president is often the decisive voice. He's the one who's typically negotiating on behalf of the United States. That's why we have a unitary executive, or at least one of the reasons we have a unitary executive in the first place. So we can be chief diplomat, so we can negotiate, right? And we know that treaties do have to go through Congress, the Senate specifically, and we know that executive agreements don't. So the president can perhaps use an executive agreement and make these decisions about diplomacy completely on his own. Now, on his own within the US government, right? We know that other actors in other governments would be involved. And we know that once the decision is made, someone is gonna have to enforce that policy. He's not gonna be day to day enforcing the policy, his bureaucrats are. We also know that there's gonna have been other people involved in the negotiating process. He's not gonna have hammered out every single detail, right? Um, that's what the State Department is for. So even when the president can be decisive, we know he's often not working alone on this larger issue of policymaking, but he does have some ability to be decisive. Now, uh, looking at agenda power in another perspective, the media has a lot of agenda power, right? Uh, so this is outside the government. The media can actually set the agenda for what we're gonna look at when we look at the government. 
So the government will often try to use that to their advantage and have the media look at things that they want the media to focus on, right? Maybe that's things that are actually not what the government is doing, right? So that we're focusing on something else that they can maybe get work done without us having to watch. Or maybe it'll be the president going public, right? And telling the media, hey, focus on this thing that I want that Congress isn't giving me in order to set the agenda for Congress and tell Congress, look, the public really wants this, so we've got to get it done. Veto power, the most obvious example is the president's veto, right? But the Senate could veto a treaty in that they could refuse to ratify it, right? Um, so we've seen veto power in contexts post midterm as well. Delegation, all sorts of times when we've seen delegation in this class. One post midterm time is when we delegate our power to our elected officials, right? In a democracy, the power stems from the people. We saw this when we looked at the development of things like the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. The power deri is derived from us. So we delegate that power to our elected officials so things get done. Can you imagine the coordination problems if every single voter had to vote on every single bill that went through Congress? I guess it wouldn't be Congress at that point, right? It would be just the public. Um, they would, Obviously, the, the coordination problems would be a nightmare. So we delegate our power. So we are the principals and we delegate our power to our agents, our elected officials, to do the things we want them to do. It facilitates collective action because now instead of all the people in the United States, it's you know 435 members of the House, 100 members of the Senate, and the president. So as much as that's still a lot of people to get to coordinate, you know, orders of magnitude fewer people than if we had to coordinate the entire population. But of course, this leads to other problems. So I've delegated my vote, my voice, my power to my elected representative, but can I guarantee that they're going to do everything I want them to do at every moment? No, right? I lose some of my agency. And I risk that every time I delegate my power, that Things might not get done the way I want to do them. There's an old saying, you know, if you want something done right, you've got to do it yourself. Well, that's basically saying there's a risk of agency loss whenever you tell someone else to do something for you, right? So in the case of voting, right, we delegate our power to our elected officials. And one way that we try to mitigate the risk of agency loss is to hold regular elections. So that if we do lose agency, if a representative is not faithful to us, we can vote them out of office and put in someone who we think will do better, will do more of what we want them to do, right? So that's why we have elections, to help try to avoid issues like agency loss. Now, enforcement and oversight, we have to, A, have people to actually enforce all these rules and jurisdictions and things like that, and oversee them. Right? We know that the lack of enforcement can actually be a real problem for the Supreme Court. Um, but, uh, sorry, enforcement power, I should say. Right? They depend on other people to enforce their rulings. But they do have sort of oversight power over uh, the rest of the government in that they have the power of judicial review. So anytime a case comes to them, they have to wait for the case to come to them, but anytime a case comes to them, they can say, oh, the actions of government were unconstitutional, right? So they can oversee those kind of um, things and make sure that the government is doing their job. So you can see that enforcement and oversight often go hand in hand. We oversee enforcement. Um, but sometimes in the case, for example, of the courts, we see that uh, they don't always go together. Now, in the case of policymaking, Right? We know that policies have to be enforced and overseen and evaluated because that last step of policymaking, evaluation, circles right back to the first step. Right? It's a cycle, it's not a straight line. So we oversee policymaking, we make sure it's in, the policies are enforced well, and if they're not or if they cause other problems, then we have to start back over. So we can see that even though all of these help solve problems, they may sometimes cause other problems. But 
they're the tools we have and we try to implement them in a way that eliminates problems the best we can. So looking again back to the sort of early first, uh, first half of the semester stuff, we know we had the Articles of Confederation. We know one of the reasons we don't have them anymore is because we're just massive coordination problems, right? They, they had not implemented nearly enough of those tools to help avoid them. So we shifted away from the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution. Remember, of course, the Articles of Confederation didn't have an executive and the Constitution added one, right? The main reason here was the Articles didn't want a tyrant and, the con and when they were drafting the Constitution, the framers realized that we could have a president or an executive, right, without risking tyranny. We just had to develop the right type of system. Now, this development of the right type of system wasn't easy. It was not a simple transition. And it wasn't entirely planned, right? These delegates got together at what we now call the Constitutional Convention, but was just called like a convention then, right? It was just this meeting and they were gonna revise the Articles of Confederation. But James Madison, the delegate from Virginia comes in and says, no, the articles are terrible. We've just got to scrap them and start fresh. And he proposes the Virginia plan, right? This was the big state plan and he proposes all sorts of things about it. So the delegate from New Jersey, William Patterson says, no, no, no. <laughs> We don't like this. What are you talking about? You're giving big states way too much power. We don't like this plan at all. And they came up with another plan. And to, to reconcile those two plans, we saw a compromise, the Connecticut or Great Compromise, right? That reconciled both plans. It established the structure of the legislature that we have today. So a house with proportional representation, a Senate with equal representation, the House has shorter terms, the Senate has longer terms, and we know those different things matter for elections, right? Also established a unitary executive, would be elected by the entire country, but with involvement from the states in terms of the Electoral College and even potentially federal involvement, right? So that was another compromise to sort of appease states' rights advocates. Now, we saw compromise on slavery, right? Both that initial log roll of the North gets strong commercial powers, the South gets slavery, but then also the three-fifths compromise, which helped us determine how we were going to apportion seats in the House and how we were going to count slaves for terms of that apportionment, right? Now, we had other compromises as well, the development of checks and balances, to ensure that if we were gonna create a federal government with more power than the states, it was going to have a lot of internal checks and balances to keep it under control. So we saw all sorts of compromises. These are just some of them in the creation of the constitution. Many of these compromises did affect the politics and policymaking processes that we see today and more importantly saw after the midterm. So federalism, just as a quick reminder, federalism is the separation of certain powers between the federal government the, at the top, the national government, and state governments, All right? It's a little confusing. Even I just said separation of powers. Uh, but this is not the same thing as checks and balances and the separations of powers between the three branches, right? Federalism, I think a better word is the division of power between the federal and state governments, right? And we know that these sort of spheres of influence were relatively well-defined in the early years, but by the 1930s with FDR and the New Deal and the Great Depression, and we saw this blending and swirling, kind of like from a layer cake to a marble cake, and it has changed somewhat. But we still see conflicts today, right? That this debate that's going on right now in the US over abortion, is going to, uh, is basically because of federalism, right? Different states are creating different laws that limit access to abortions. And since the Supreme Court has in the past said that abortion is protected under the constitutional right to privacy, this is setting up a conflict between the federal and state governments, right? 
now we see, or federal law, right, constitutional law and state governments, I should say. Now, if the uh, Constitution is at stake, in the case of these challenges to abortion, it may be that the court says, yeah, no, the, these um, laws are unconstitutional and just strikes them down. But what happens if a state law is considered constitutional, but in conflict with a federal law, like what we saw during McCulloch versus Maryland, for example, or perhaps something we might see uh, with different sanctuary city issues or um, uh, legalization of marijuana, right? States have control over intrastate within the state commerce. The federal government has control interstate commerce, commerce outside the state. So federal laws, federal drug laws tend to rest on interstate commerce powers, but state drug laws obviously rest on intrastate powers, the ability to regulate commerce just within your own state. So if both parties are behaving constitutionally, but their laws are in conflict, the Supreme Court has the final say on whose law is right. And they will side with the federal government. This is because of the supremacy clause, which says that if the federal government and the state governments are both acting constitutionally and in conflict, then the federal government will win. Now, I, I mentioned abortion is the first example of an issue with federalism that we're seeing you know, in, in the world today that affects sort of our lives potentially. That likely would not be a case of the supremacy clause being applied, right? Because if say the Texas law is overturned, it would be on the basis of it being unconstitutional. And if it were upheld, it would be on the basis of the law being constitutional, right? So we wouldn't be seeing a conflict between state and federal law there. We would be seeing a conflict between state and constitutional law. But the reason this involves federalism is if the court says that Texas's law or any other state law, there are several states uh, that have passed laws that the court will be hearing, if any of these state laws are constitutional, or if the court goes as far as saying that abortion is not protected under the constitutional right to privacy, or perhaps that the constitutional right to privacy does not exist in the way that the court originally had conceived of it, then what we would see is a patchwork of different state-by-state -state regulations on abortion, because the federal government wouldn't necessarily be immediately involved in this each state could do their own thing, right? And if Texas even, if Texas is allowed to keep this law, that's not going to suddenly make it so that us in New York have to obey that law, right? It's Texas's law. So that's federalism. It can create this patchwork of state by state laws. And this was intentional, right? This was partially to appease state right, states rights advocates, but also partially because of the idea that small democracy is sort of the best democracy and that states are the laboratories of democracy. They'll try out new things, and then if they're sort of popular, maybe eventually they'll become national. So we will see then that issues like that end up varying state by state because of federalism. Now, why do we have a Bill of Rights? This was in part to appease the anti-federalists, right? They were saying we shouldn't ratify the constitution, creates too powerful a federal government. State governments might be kept in check by state bills of rights, but the federal government, we need to keep them in check with one. And obviously, and sort of a bigger issue to limit the government, right? These, the Bill of Rights grants us certain rights and liberties, right? We can think of it in, the ter in terms of positive and negative rights. It forces the government to do certain things for us, like provide us with a jury trial in certain types of cases, but it also provide, it forces the government to not do certain things, right? It limits the government. For example, the government cannot compel us to testify against ourselves. Right? That's pleading the fifth, right? So we see then that the Bill of Rights was there to protect rights, to protect negative rights primarily, to limit the government but also to guarantee us certain positive rights.
Now, these limits on the government often are thought of in terms of political rights, right? They protect a lot of aspects of the political process. For example, the First Amendment, those first five rights that are stuck into that First Amendment, the freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, of assembly, and of petition, those are all about politics. And if you recall in class, we talked about how religion can be seen as a political right. Now, these five rights all make it so that things like political parties can exist and interest groups and why the government can't restrict campaign finance too much and um, why we have a free media in the US, right? So all these things, especially though freedom of speech and of the press are really important for things we've talked about in the second unit. So we will move on then to part three, where we look at the institutions of government in our next video.